try to drop all sensual thoughts, all unskillful qualities in the mind. We reach a he come may he, we reach a angusale he tam may he. Think about the breath, evaluate the breath. So there's a sense of ease and well being. This is how you got the mind into concentration. Concentration is part of the path. When you practice the path, that's called paying homage through the practice, bhati bhati bhucha. The kind of homage that the Buddha preferred. Tonight's asalaha bhucha. We're paying homage on the full moon in the month of asalaha. To remember the date when the Buddha first set forth the Dhamma as a teaching. The Dhamma, of course, exists all the time, just the truth of the world. But to have it put into words so that people can practice it, that's a rare opportunity. That's what the Buddha did on this night. Two months after he'd gained his awakening, he went and taught the five brethren, people who had looked after him while he was doing his austerities, but then had abandoned him when they felt that he'd when they seen that he had abandoned his austerities, basically given up on him. And paradoxically, when they gave up on him, that was when he gained awakening. After gaining awakening, he sat under the Bodhi tree and stayed in the area of the Bodhi tree for seven weeks, experiencing the bliss of release. And then, on the invitation of the Brahma Sampati, he decided to teach. And the five brethren were the first people he went to teach. At first, they were disinclined to listen to him. Even after he had said two or three times that he had gained awakening, seen the deathless, and he was going to teach it to them. But then he reminded them, have I ever made a claim like this before? They realized that he was the sort of person who would not make claims idly. So they decided to listen, give him a chance. And that's when he set the wheel of Dharma in motion. Like the Dharma wheel we have on the wall here, twelve spokes. They represent the Four Noble Truths and then the three levels of knowledge appropriate to each truth. There's the truth of stress or suffering, dukkha. The truth of the cause, the truth of the cessation, and the truth of the path of practice leading to cessation. Those are the four truths. Stress, the Buddha said, is or suffering. There's the stress of birth. He gave a list of examples. The stress of suffering of birth, aging, illness, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, despair. Of having to be with what you don't like, of being parted from what you do like, not getting what you want. Then he said, five clinging aggregates. He didn't explain it. Moved on to the next truth. The cause of stress and suffering is craving, the kind of craving that gives rise to becoming. He gave a list, three kinds. The craving of sensuality, the craving for becoming, and the craving for no becoming. The truth of the cessation was the abandoning of that craving. In other words, to get rid of the stress and suffering, you don't abandon the, the stress or suffering, you abandon the cause, developing total dispassion for the cause. And then there was the path of practice, starting with right view and going on through right concentration. In other words, in setting out these Four Noble Truths, he was setting out right view. That's the only part of the path that he really explained, and didn't even explain that fully. But it was enough, as we'll see. And then he went on to explain that each of these truths has three levels of knowledge. Simply knowing the truth, that's the first level. Knowing the duty appropriate to each truth is the second level. Stress and suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned, the cessation is to be realized, and the path leading to the cessation should be developed. 
That's the second level. The third level is knowing that you've complete, he had completed those duties. And then he said it was when he had fulfilled all three levels of knowledge for all Four Noble Truths, that's when he knew that he had gained full awakening. In other words, he's making a claim for awakening and the results of awakening, which is that there would be no further birth, no further suffering. And in the course of that, he gave a sketch of right view. And the important point was he's pointing out that suffering comes from craving. That's all he really explained. But that was enough. And Nyan Gontanya, the head of the Five Brethren, got the Dharma eye. In other words, he became at least a stream mender, seeing all things that are subject to Origination are subject to cessation. Now to see that, he had to see something that was not subject to origination or cessation. That was the deathless. That's when we say that the noble Sangha arose in the world. The Devas made note of the fact all the way up to the Brahma world. And then it was after that that and Nyan Gondanya asked for ordination, and that's how the conventional Sangha began. So notice, the Buddha didn't explain everything. He explained the connection between craving and suffering. But that was enough for An Nyan Gondanya. So that's all the Buddha taught that night, at least as far as is recorded. There may have been more, but this is what was remembered and passed on. Of course, for us, we hear that and we're still here without anything new happening. We're the type of people who have to listen to the Dharma and then put it into practice. And it's for us that the Buddha later explained all these truths and explained all the different factors of the path in great detail. And we can listen to that even then. We still need to practice more. So that's what we're doing right now, is practicing more. We've practiced before, but we have to keep at it. Because there's something in our minds that's still resisting something that still doesn't understand. But we keep at it. We keep being persistent. Because we have some conviction that this might be the way to true happiness. We're inspired by the example of the Buddha and the Noble Sangha. We find the Dharma inspiring. And so we sit here and practice. And at the very least, we're paying homage to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha in recollection of the fact that this was the night in which all three of the refuges, all three of the gems, became complete as a set. Because after all, the Buddha, if he hadn't taught, he would, become a, he would have been a private Buddha. But the fact that he was able to give this teaching, and that someone was able to gain awakening, it's the existence of the Dharma as a teaching is the existence of the Sangha that makes the Buddha a complete Buddha. So the Triple Gem became complete. And we're trying to make that triple gem complete in ourselves as well, just as we're trying to make that dharma wheel complete in ourselves. Which of the spokes is missing? You know the Four Noble Truths, you've probably heard the words, but at least you got four spokes. So as other spokes, the spokes of actually doing the duty and completing the duty, that's what remains. And the big factor that's usually missing is your concentration, getting the mind under control, because the mind is wandering around so much. And we don't develop the path, we develop other things. We develop our thoughts about food, clothing, shelter, thoughts about material gain, status, praise, pleasures. Those are the thoughts we tend to develop. But the Buddha didn't teach us to develop those things. He taught us to abandon them. 
So tonight let's take some time to really focus on developing concentration. Any sensual thought that comes up right now, just put it aside. Think about the breath, evaluate the breath so you can give rise to a sense of pleasure and rapture. And then maintain that. It's easy to focus on the breath. The maintaining is hard. But it's a skill that can be mastered. Especially when you appreciate the, the advantages that come from mastering this skill. It makes it easier to stick with it. So if you find the mind wandering off, remind yourself, if you don't master this skill, there's just a lot of suffering left over. A lot of suffering waiting for you in the, in the future. And there's a lot of suffering weighing, around, weighing down the body, <coughs> excuse me, weighing down the mind right now. We tend not to notice it because that's what's been weighing down the mind for so long. It's like one of those workers in Thailand that unload ships, carrying huge sacks every day. They carry these sacks, sacks, sacks of sacks of flour, sacks of rice, sacks of all kinds of things. And they're used to being weighed down. Because we're so weighed down, we forget that this isn't the way things have to be. We can be a lot lighter. We can choose not to carry our burdens. Unlike those workers, we don't need to suffer. They need to carry the staff because they need, they need the money. But what payment are we getting for carrying things around? Nothing at all. We get a little bit of pleasure. I mean, it's our going after the pleasure that ties us down to the craving. But you have to stop and ask, is it really worth it? Look at the pleasure you get out of greed, aversion, and delusion, and then look at the drawbacks. The human mind is very poor, generally, at weighing drawbacks and advantages, or weighing drawbacks and benefits. We tend to go for the short term and forget about the long term, and then we complain about our suffering forgetting that, well, we made the choice. So take some time to let go of your burdens. Get secluded from sensuality and anything that's un unskillful. See what it's like. mind doesn't touch any of these things, doesn't get involved with any of these things. It's right here with the breath. Thinking about the breath, evaluating the breath, when there's a sense of pleasure, let it spread through the body. Survey the body to see if there are any patterns of tension or any, if there's any sense of blockage anywhere. Think of the breath penetrating that, going right through, until you can fill the body with that sense of pleasure, fill the body with that sense of ease. Like the water that seeps through the ground. And the trees pick it up and they let the water flow throughout the entire tree. Up the trunk, out to the leaves. Through the roots, up the trunk, out to the leaves. Every part of the tree is moistened. Try to keep your body fully moistened with pleasure and rapture, or at least pleasure and refreshment. Give yourself fully to this path. And this is how you pay homage correctly to the Buddha. We have the candle circumambulation, and it's nice to think about the symbolism of the flowers, candles, and incense. Incense stands for virtue. As the Buddha said, the sweet smell of virtue unlike the smell of incense, can go against the wind. In other words, a virtuous person is respected in all directions. Concentration is like the flowers. The flowers bloom. Discernment is like the candles. gives light. 
And you notice we started out with just one or two candles out there, and then as we lit one another's candles, we all got the radiance of the candles. We all benefited. And as you gave flame to someone else's candle, your flame was not diminished, and their flame, their candle got brighter. And you got some of that brightness, too. It's good to reflect on the goodness and other things we give to one another. Our goodness is not depleted, and everybody benefits from the goodness that we give to one another. So it's nice to think about the symbolism, but it's even better to do the reality of the practice, to develop the virtue and the concentration and the, and the discernment. And as John Lee pointed out, it's that concentration is a difficult one. It's like a bridge going across the river. The pilings next to the banks on either side are relatively easy, but it's the pilings in the middle of the river. Those are the ones that take a lot of work. So give your time to the concentration. That's the homage the Buddha wanted, because you benefit from it. And not only you, and as you develop these good qualities in mind, they, they bloom and they give light that you can share with the people around you. That's why the goodness of the path is so good. It doesn't create boundaries. It, dis it dissolves boundaries. It's a happiness that spreads around. We're the recipients of all the people who've practiced the Dharma and have kept the memory of the Dharma alive. They themselves benefited from the practice, and their light has shed light on us. We'll make sure that our candles are lit so that we benefit from the light and we shed light on into the future. <laughs>